Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yes, so my task today is to try and talk to you about um, some creepy crawlies in Western Australia, things as Teresa said you might be concerned about and things that I think you should be concerned about, things that uh, might be um, turn out to be harmless and not all, not all that dangerous. Also, there's a couple of myths and hoaxes out there that I'll talk about as well. So we're going to start by um, talking about Western Australia and the landscape that we live in. And probably a lot of you are already aware that Western Australia is an unbelievably ancient landscape. The rocks, many of the rocks that are here that most of Western Australia is based upon um, are very, very old. And there's whole areas of Western Australia that have never been inundated by seawater. There's been no recent mountain building. There's been no glaciations covering uh, Western Australia with large packs of ice like there were in the Northern Hemisphere and parts of Eastern Australia a long time ago. And what this means is that there's been vast amounts of time for life forms, plants and animals and other organisms to exist in Western Australia, to be here all the time basically. They haven't been wiped out by glaciers or sea level rises and um, this meant, means that we've got many animals that have evolved slowly over time uh, into our local environment. So we've got a very, very unusual, a very, very diverse fauna and flora and the, the creepy crawlies I'm going to talk about today form part of that. Now, um, as I said started this, at the start of this talk, there's many types of creepy crawlies I'm going to go through today. I'm going to dispel some myths and provide hopefully some factual information that you can take home. Now, one of the, the groups of animals that um, are quite common in Western Australia, as in other parts of Australia, are scorpions. A lot of people aren't aware of the fact that scorpions are in Australia. In fact, when I started at the museum over 20 years ago, I had a public inquiry one afternoon, a woman who lived up in the hills, and she rang me up. She was really distressed, and she said, I've just found a scorpion in my backyard. And I said, well, yep, yep, that's fine. She said, but, but you know, I didn't know we had scorpions in Australia. How long have they been here? And I said, well, 400 million years. And she said, don't you get smart with me, young man. So she had assumed that they'd been brought in by somebody from overseas. But we do have many different types of scorpions in Australia. And luckily, hardly any of them um, are painful, uh, sorry, are dangerous. Um, the sting from some is very, very painful. Um, and we certainly have none that are considered deadly. The, um, the biggest genus uh, in Australia is this genus called Eurodacus. It's biggest in two ways, in terms of numbers of different species um, and also in the size of the animals. Probably the biggest would, if you stretch them out, they could be up to about sort of 15 centimetres long, six inches in the old money. Um, the males are that big. They're found all over mainland Australia. They don't occur in Tasmania. Some of them are quite large, as I've mentioned. And they, they look really dangerous, um, but the sting that they deliver, the venom that comes out of this sting at the end here, is um, painful, but not particularly dangerous. In fact, I've rather stupidly been stung by two of these scorpions. Um, each time I had them on my hand and I was showing somebody a scorpion, which is something I normally don't do very often. And each time they scuttled up the sleeve of my shirt and they got distressed when I was trying to undo my shirt and they went, ah, and it was quite painful. But the, the pain went away after about 15 minutes. So it wasn't, uh, it was certainly what I would call less painful than a bee sting. So everybody's probably had a bee sting once or twice in their life. Um, that's the threshold that I measure these things against. Now in contrast, this other family that's also quite common um, is a family called Boothidae. In Australia, we have a series of species. They're sometimes called marbled scorpions because they have a mottled coloration. Um, they're often a lot smaller than, than the big Eurodacus I just showed. Um, they've got a very, very thick tail, but very, very thin pedipalps. These are these segments at the front are called pedipalps. They're like sort of crab's claws. Um, and they're very, very thin and small. Now, these guys can seriously pack a punch. So there's some species in, um, in Southern Africa, the Middle East, Central and South America that kill hundreds of people every year through their venoms. In fact, a species uh, in Mexico that's very common in some of the biggest cities and towns, uh, recently there's an antivenin that's just been developed and they think that that's going to save anywhere between two and 400 people's lives a year once the antivenin is taken out into hospitals. There are many, many different species, uh, once again, all over Australia, and they're all over mainland Australia. None of these guys live in Tans Tasmania. And as I mentioned, they've got these thin little pedipalps. They so, are um, quite distinct from that previous family. Now, there's another family. If you've ever been up to the northern Australia, to um, tropical Queensland, the, yes? 
sorry, no, I, I should have mentioned that. They, in fact, can't, none of the Australian ones are known to be dangerous to humans in Australia. I've been stung by one of those as well, and that was very, very, very painful, but I'm still here. There's been no recorded deaths from those ones, only the, the species that are found overseas. Thank you, sir. Um, another family that's found um, in, in Australia are the Lyakilidae. They're found in tropical Queensland, um, the top, top end of the Northern Territory and into the Kimberley. They have very, very big pedipalps, these segments at the front here, but they have a very, very small ineffectual tail. Um, I'm not aware of anybody being stung by one of these things, um, but I would imagine that they've probably got so little venom that I guess you might not feel it. Um, and as I said, they're, they're found across the top end into the Kimberley here in Western Australia. Now the fourth family are actually quite small, and these are in, in the southwest, these are sometimes the most common type of scorpion they might bump into. Um, they're often found in places like the Cary and the Jarrah Forest, they get out into the wheat belt. Um, there are some species that occur as far north as the Pilbara, but they're quite rare up there. And the sting is slightly painful. I've not been stung myself, but I have, have heard of other people who have been stung, um, and certainly much, much less painful than a bee sting. And you can see these guys sometimes coming into um, houses, especially up in the hills uh, here in, in the Darling Range. And I would imagine that this is the type of scorpion that a lady who rang me up 20 years ago complaining about scorpions being in Australia, that, that's the one she had inside her house. And the reason that they uh, come inside houses is that during the mating season, males will wander in search of females. Um, and so they will uh, walk into houses, they'll find little gaps underneath doors, they drop into swimming pools. Um, I've heard them drown, of, of them drowning in bowls of water that have been left out for the dog, that sort of thing. So uh, the males are on the move, so more often than not when people do find them inside their houses, it's actually the adult males. And the scorpion uh, males mature, depending on which species it is, they mature at different times of the year. So these guys tend to mature during um, winter, autumn and winter. Um, the big Eurydacus we showed before, they often mature during summer, so there's often seasonal differences. Yeah. Yes, like uh, scorpions do grow through molting, like they're, they're a type of arthropod. So all arthropods have to shed their skin to grow. So spiders and scorpions or arachnids, um, insects, crustaceans like lobsters and prawns have to do that as well. So every so often when they need to, need to enlarge themselves, they shed that skin and they crawl out of it. They're very pale at that stage and then they, have to, they darken themselves and they grow a little bit. They grow about uh, somewhere between about 7 and 10% in body size walk around, the scorpions will go around for another few months and they molt again. And they'll do that several times until they reach adulthood. So that might take seven or eight times before they're finally adult. Um, the first aid for scorpions is, is quite simple. Um, the, the application of a cold pack uh, certainly takes away that local pain and it sometimes there's a little bit of swelling as well. Um, if the pain persists, always seek medical aid um, every single time, but as I said, all of the cases of scorpion stings that I'm aware of in Australia, some are quite painful um, and most just the pain goes away fairly quickly. I have heard of a solution to scorpion stings uh, where the opposite treatment to a cold pack was applied and that's to apply a heat pack. Um, and in fact, I've heard of people um, actually peeing on their scorpion sting with uh, the warmth from the urine, apparently um, denaturing the scorpion venom, which is largely a series of very, very big proteins. Now, I don't know whether these stories are apocryphal or not, but the people who did pee on themselves did find that the pain did go away. Mind you, um, Red Cross and other medical organisations recommend a cold pack, not a heat pack. Now, let's move on to spiders. This is going to be the bulk of the talk because spiders are amongst those creepy crawlies that people either tend to love or they, they tend to hate. And what I'm going to do is to basically run you through um, different types of spiders and then we'll talk about each of the, the so-called creepy crawlies as we go, go through the talk. Now there are three types of spiders. Uh, these, these are the first group are mesothelial spiders, then there's mygalomorphs and aranimorphs. I'll get to these two groups shortly. Yes? Are those, are those a genus name? Which one, sorry? Uh, these ones? Yeah. No, these are, th this is a suborder mesotheli. Suborder? Sub and these two are the category they are at the moment are infraorders. So they're major groups of spiders. So there's the order, order Araniae, which is all spiders. And then you've got these, uh, these suborder and then these two infraorders um, um, classified within them. Now this, this branching diagram I've got here actually shows 
the evolutionary pathways by which these things have evolved. So when spiders evolved about 400 million years ago, they broke into two major groups. These very primitive mesothelial spiders, these ones here, and then these two groups which I'll talk about shortly. Now mesothelial spiders are very unusual because you can probably make out that they have um, retained their um, um, sort of segments on their abdomen like, um, like a lot of other arachnids do, like scorpions. Now all other spiders, including, including trapdoor spiders and true spiders, actually don't have these, these uh, sclerites, these segments across their back. And these guys are literally living fossils. We've got fossils of these that go back 300, 350 million years that are found in various parts of the world. But these spiders are still alive today, living in Southeast Asia. And I've been lucky enough to see those in, in Malaysia. Um, and they're quite, quite remarkable spiders. Very, very, uh, very pretty. I think they're very pretty. And um, there are some that are probably endangered species because they're being collected as part of the international pet trade and shipped off to the USA um, and to Europe as part of the pet trade. So whole populations in Malaysia and other parts of the world are being decimated. Yes? Um, a leg span of these guys is about this big. So they're quite large as far as spiders go. Now the other two major groups of spiders, so mesothelial spiders don't occur in Australia. We've, uh, they are probably here a long, long time ago, but they uh, since disappeared. Now Australian spiders can be divided into these two major groups, mygalomorph spiders and araneomorph spiders. Mygalomorph spiders include trapdoor spiders, funnel web spiders, um, various other hairy big spiders that people tend not to like. And the araneomorph spiders include all other spiders, so redback spiders, huntsman spiders, orb weaving spiders. Um, Mygalomorph spiders um, are all characterized by their fangs operating in a particular direction, and the uraniumorph spiders have fangs going in a different direction. And these are what these arrows signify. So Mygalomorph spiders have their fangs that actually strike downwards parallel to each other like this, and uraniumorph spiders have their fangs that bite inwards this way. And this is a fundamental difference. And what this means is that these guys that have the fangs operating downwards this way, the only way that they can clear enough space underneath their body to actually bite something, like an insect or your finger if you happen to get in the way, is they have to lift the front part of the body off the ground, they have to bring their front legs up into the air, clear enough space underneath them, then they strike downwards this way onto their prey. These guys, um, the fangs bite inwards this way and they don't have to make space for their fangs to operate. And what this meant was that when these types of spiders evolved, probably 250 million years ago, it meant that they could do all sorts of things um, in a, catching their prey that the other guys couldn't do, that the mygalomorph spiders couldn't do. Mygalomorphs need to brace themselves on the ground, on something hard to be able to lift themselves up in the air and strike down. These guys didn't have to do that. And that let these guys uh, evolve different types of webs, um, such as aerial webs, the orb weaving spider you might see outside at night, webs that you might get up in the corner of a room or in your shed. They didn't have to brace themselves against something hard because their fangs worked this way. And it allowed these guys to diversify into all habitats, all terrestrial habitats, all over the world very quickly. And that's where spiders occur today. So trapdoor spiders in Western Australia, so we, we, all of these mygalomorph spiders we tend to call trapdoor spiders. The reason we do that is because um, many of them have a trapdoor lid on their burrow, although others have open holes, they don't have a trapdoor, but we tend to call them all this loose name, trapdoor spiders. Now they're very, very similar to things like funnel web spiders, which I'll talk about shortly, are in Eastern Australia. And the good thing about, one of the things I really like about trapdoor spiders in Western Australia is that they're really diverse. There's lots of them, there's lots of species. So some genera contain over 100 species in them. And at the moment, most of these species are unnamed. So they're new, new species that we're aware of. And we're trying to go through the process of naming those, which is very time consuming. And some species are very scarce and some of them represent threatened species. The scarce ones and some of the threatened ones um, occur in habitats like in the wheat belt where a lot of the landscape's been cleared for agriculture, leaving little pockets where the spiders are just holding on. And we know of some populations of some of these trapdoor spiders, because they can't move between these isolated habitats any longer, 
um, where some of these populations are just represented by very, very old females because some of them can live to 30, 40, 50 years old um, with no males left in the population whatsoever. So there's no chance of, it, of them being able to breed any longer, which is quite tragic. So we're keeping an eye on some of those. Now, as I mentioned before, many of them have um, uh, trapdoor lids. This is, a, this is a typical trapdoor spider that you might see out in the wheat belt in Western Australia. This lid's about the size of a 20 cent piece, so it's about this big. Um, she, in this case it's a female, she lines the, uh, the burrow with little twigs that come out this way, and at night she will actually sit at the entrance with the trapdoor up about 30 degrees, with her front legs sticking out, touching these twigs on the outside here waiting for something to go past so waiting for something edible you know a small cockroach a beetle um, you know naughty child that sort of thing no not naughty children they don't eat children so they just wait there waiting for something to go past when it does they rush out grab it and drag it back into their their burrow take it right down to the bottom some of the burrows are quite deep they can be up to half a meter deep um, in some situations sometimes they're a little bit more shallow some of the spiders are actually quite big. Legs and all on some of the really big ones can be about this big. So there's a trapdoor spider burrow, believe it or not, in some, um, some dead grass and aloe casuarina needles. And that's, that's my left hand holding up. So that's the, same, that's the same burrow. So often they're very, very hard to see. That's the burrow just in there. And it was only spotted because of the sort of unusual arrangement of the uh, twigs that's used there. And then you lift it up and there's a beautiful little burrow, all lined with silk. Uh, the silk probably has all sorts of uh, good reasons for it, keeping out things like ants and centipedes is a, and the lid itself will do that. So as I said before, there's lots of different sorts of trapdoor spiders in Western Australia. There are some that are um, sort of tanny, reddy brown in colour, especially they often mimic the the coloration of the soil that they're on. So if you occur in an area where there's red sands, you often get these reddy brown spiders. Um, this is one of these really big ones I was talking about before. Um, you know, leg, leg spread like about this, this big, probably very old as well, each of the individuals. Um, we have things called uh, whistling spiders or barking spiders in, in Australia that occur in the desert regions. And they act are actually our version of what would be called a tarantula overseas. Now the reason they're called whistling spiders or barking spiders because on the inside of the fangs here, on the inside of the clissary, there's a series of bristles that, that face out this way. And what they're able to do when they're agitated and when you get too close to them and they want you to go away, they'll actually make a warning sound. And they do it by very quickly rubbing their fangs together on the inside and these bristles are actually shaped in such a way that it can make a a bit of a sound and it, it's it's probably it's quite audible you can actually hear it and it's a <laughs> noise and basically what they're saying is go away because the next thing I'm going to do if you come any closer is try and bite you and these are quite large spiders so you know leg span of these guys is is quite big and I haven't heard of anybody being bitten one but I imagine it would be quite painful not just from the venom but because the fangs are so thick and so long just going into your skin would be quite painful all by itself. So if you've never heard one of these, um, and if you do hear it, keep your distance. You can bite. This is, the, um, this is the female and the male of the same species of trapdoor spider. This is one called a brush-footed trapdoor spider. They've got these pads on the end of each of their feet. Um, you can see these little things coming off the end here. And what's unusual about this species is that the female um, is all black basically, but the male has got these beautiful silver hairs all over its head and all over its abdomen, and we've got no idea why. Now, these brush-footed trapdoor spiders, this was actually brought into the museum. Somebody, somebody had dug it up in their backyard from up in one of the northern suburbs, and um, we weren't able to release it because they need to be able to, they build their own burrows. Once you destroy their burrow, they can't build a new one. And uh, it was brought into the museum, and I was actually, I had this in a, in a dish of, or like, a, like an aquarium on sand in my house. Um, the brush footed things, uh, the brush feet, the little pads on the end of their feet mean that they can climb up glass really well. I was taking all these photographs. Um, I went up to the front of the house to go to the loo. I came back, the aquarium was empty. My wife was sitting at the other end of our, our dining room table where I was doing all of this. I said, uh, uh, sweetheart, 
there's like a really, really big black spider that's just kind of like walked out of the aquarium. And so if you happen to see it, could you, could you just let me know? And so we searched the house, we couldn't find it. And, um, and so anyway, next morning we got up and we told the kids who, you know, they were asleep when this happened the night before. I said, oh, if you see a black spider, don't get scared, just tell me where it is. And we found it curled up um, in the corner of the, the same room the following morning, so I hadn't lost it. So they're quite good at walking straight up glass walls, apparently. Sorry? Mm-hmm. Um, yes, all of these trapdoor spider males would only be active, well, most of them would only be active at night time. Well, the, the female spider would only stay down her burrow. She wouldn't see him. So, I have no idea why it's silver. Yeah. yeah. Um, do the male spiders move significantly shorter periods of time? They do. Yeah, I was going to get to that, so excuse me. So um, this, this is another um, type of um, trapdoor spider. This we call a mouse spider. It's one of the, uh, one of the types that, of trapdoor spider in, Western, in Australia that I would not like to be bitten by. So they're certainly um, probably, there's a species in Eastern Australia that's actually possibly quite toxic. And these guys I wouldn't trust whatsoever. Now this particular spider um, looks as though it's got 10 legs. Now spiders and their relatives like scorpions um, have eight legs, four pairs of legs. These guys look as though they've got 10. And so the, the extra pair at the front here is actually the pedipalps. Now the pedipalps in scorpions are the big claws. Pedipalps in spiders are normally actually quite short um, little structures and they are used in females just to help move the, the prey, which is other invertebrates like beetles and cockroaches, into their mouth. But in spiders, they've become modified to, um, to actually transmit sperm into the female. So these little structures in the spiders on the end of these pedipalps here, he actually deposits sperm from his genital opening, which is on the underside of the abdomen, into a little bit of web. He pulls the sperm into the, um, into the pedipalp, stores the sperm in the bulb here, he courts with the female, he takes her dancing, buys her chocolates and flowers, and then he mates with her. And he pumps the sperm into her genital opening. Um, in this case, in this particular spider, these pedipalps have evolved to become very, very long. And it's possi possibly because all of this happens deep down inside the burrow, and he's probably positioning himself in such a way that he has to reach down past the female to reach her genital opening, and we're guessing that's why these things are actually so long. Um, it looks as though they've got 10 legs rather than eight. And years ago, I had an inquiry, phone inquiry here at the museum. Guy rang me up, he was completely drunk from a hotel. They'd found one of these things walking around the hotel car park in the middle of the day because it is one of the only trapdoor spiders in Australia, which is in fact, the males are diurnal and walking around during the day. And they were absolutely convinced that they'd found a mutant spider with 10 legs and he had a $200 bet going with his drunk, drunk mate so that it had 10 legs. I had to tell him that this was in fact a pair of pedipalps and not the legs so he was going to lose $200. So he wasn't very happy with my response. Now, a lot of these guys, a lot of these species have these bright red fangs. They have bright red heads. And it's possibly because if they are as toxic as, as we think they are, they, it might be a way of deterring predators like birds and small mammals. So they might be able to, like a, like a warning coloration, they also tend to have a, a bluish tinge on the abdomen as well. And you can often make that out on, on the specimen. So these things seem to be able to walk around during the middle of the day, especially during autumn and winter. And, uh, and so we get inquiries from people seeing them coming up their driveway. I had a lady hysterical one day. She saw two of these marching up her driveway. She thought she was being invaded. So they had a bit of native bush nearby and that's where they were coming from. So they're quite amazing spiders and lots of different species. So the, um, the now I'm gonna get back to your question now. The, the issue of the, um, the ages of the different spiders, I mentioned before that many species of these trapdoor spiders might live to their um, 30, 40, 50 years old. And, and these guys are a really good example of that. So the females um, can live to several decades. We know that if they don't get eaten by a bandicoot or centipede or something in the meantime. But the males, um, like this guy, will mature at about six or seven or eight years old. And they will go through um, six or seven molts. And then the female will just keep living past that. And probably every two years, 
produce a mate with a male and produce an egg sac and produce young. So it's actually a long time between the mating season for these guys. But um, the boys, once they're adult, once they're up on the surface, they, they move around, they mate with as many females as possible and they drop dead. And normally when I say that in talks, I say, oh, I went to university with engineering students and they were just like that. So I apologize if any of you did engineering because I did do that once and said, oh, I'm an engineer. I wasn't like that. So, um, but anyway, these guys are relatively short lived compared to the, to the females. Now, the preamble to all of this about the creepy crawlies is that probably the question I've been asked the most while I've been working in Western Australia, um, it happens just about, oh, not, not so much anymore, but in the past, nearly every working day of my life during <clears throat> uh, periods when trapdoor spider, spider males were walking around is people ring up and say, I found a funnel web spider in my backyard. Now the good news is, the funnel web spiders are not found in Western Australia. They've never been found in Western Australia. Um, I hear of people who say, oh, I found a funnel web spider in my backyard. Um, my neighbour moved over from Sydney three years ago. It must have come in the back of their car. Every single situation where we found, um, where people have sent the specimen in or sent a photograph in for us, it's always turned out to be a local trapdoor spider. Funnel web spiders naturally occur in southeastern Australia, as far west as the Eyre Peninsula. There are native species over there, quite small ones, not as big as the Sydney funnel web spider. And there's a species that lives up here on the Atherton Tableland. Now, the reason this is good news, as you're probably aware, funnel web spiders are very, very toxic. Um, they've killed a number of people, especially in um, the Sydney region and also as a species in southeastern Queensland that's quite dangerous. Um, and they're considered certainly the most poisonous spiders in Australia and one of the most poisonous spiders in the world. Um, it's unfortunate that one of the most toxic species of this whole genus um, actually lives in a relatively small area on the New South Wales coast and that's where we've happened to plonk Sydney, right dead smack in the middle of where they like to live. So there's, you know, four million people um, living around funnel web spiders. The good news is that they're mostly restricted to relatively moist um, gullies and other environments. They're not all over Sydney, they're not sort of in every, every single suburb. And in the 1980s an antivenine was developed. And so if you can get yourself to hospital, the antivenine can be used and um, there's been certainly no major problems from funnel web spiders ever since. And superficially, funnel web spiders do look very much like a lot of our local trapdoor spiders, but if you know what you're looking for, they're quite easy to tell apart. So the good news is, as I've said, despite the fact we've been sent probably thousands of specimens and photographs into the museum over the last hundred years, um, we've never ever seen a funnel web. I think that they can't survive a journey in the back of a vehicle across the Nullarbor. I think it gets too hot for them. Um, they, they prefer shaded, moist gullies in southeastern Australia, and you get them into a situation where it's getting too dry for them, like in the back of a truck or back of a car. Um, I don't think they'll survive very well. And even if they did get into southwestern Australia, I doubt that they could survive um, too well. The only way a population could get started is if a gravid female um, came over in a truck somewhere and she was able to get out into the bush and start breeding and then hopefully with, well hopefully, but one of her males would then mate back with her or with one of his sisters. It all seems a bit unlikely. So the good news is no funnel web spiders in Western Australia. Now, I think probably the most common Sorry, the most toxic spider in, in Western Australia is a redback spider. And it's also probably our most common spider. I mean, every, probably just about every house uh, in Perth has at least one redback spider around it at each, at some times of the year, any time of the year. Um, I used to, when I first came to Perth, I, I lived over in, I used to work here on this site, I now work out at Welshpool, and I lived in East Perth, and I used to walk over every day. And one day during spring, I decided to try and count all of the redback spider webs I could see between East Perth and here. It only took me 15 minutes to walk in and I lost count at about 50. I'm actually not very good with figures. I lost count at 50. Now, a lot of those webs might not have had active spiders in them, but they would have in the last previous couple of months because the webs are very, very distinctive. Um, you get them on the corners of buildings. You get them um, underneath rubbish in backyards and out in the bush, up against playground equipment, anywhere where there's a little hidey hole for the female spider to place herself. Um, they're great at, 
at, find, at surviving in these sorts of environments that we've created for them, basically. They also don't mind it getting hot. You can, have, you can find them under sheets of corrugated tin out in the bush in the middle of, not in the desert, but in the semi-arid areas where it's really, really hot. These guys can cope with it. And that's quite characteristic of all of the different redback spider species which belong to this bigger group called the widow spiders. So black widows, brown widows, the button spiders. I've got all sorts of names in various parts of the world. And the hotter the better for these guys, basically. They just really, really like it. Now, the good thing about redback spider venom is that it's very, very slow acting. So you've got plenty of time if somebody is bitten to go and deal with the problem. Um, and in doing so, um, seek medical treatment. Anybody who's bitten by a redback spider, go to a hospital, go to a doctor and get it checked out. Don't panic. I heard of somebody in the goldfields who was um, bitten by a redback spider in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s it might have been, and he panicked and took off sort of helter-skelter through the streets of Kalgoorlie and smashed his car because he wanted to get as fast as possible to the hospital. As I said, the good thing is it's very, very slow acting. Fatalities are very, very rare. An anti venine was developed in the mid-1950s. As far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a fatality in Australia ever since then. So this is really good news. Um, and we're not sure, but it seems as though people react uh, differently to redback spider bites um, from one bite to another. So I've heard of people who um, bitten by redback spiders and they need to be hospitalized for a week and they need a bit of anti venine um, and others who are also bitten and they're just fine, they just keep on going. Years ago in Kalgoorlie I did a School of the Air episode with the kids one morning um, out in the, the outback areas and, and we were talking about redback spiders and this little boy came on and he said, he said, um, yeah, we, my mum and dad have been bitten by a redback spider. My dad was bitten and he, w he was in hospital for a week, but my mum was bitten and she just kept on cooking dinner. And I think he was a little bit disappointed with his dad, to tell you the truth, but um, he was a very sweet little boy. Now, one of the things about redback spiders is that they, um, the adult females are jet black um, with this red stripe down the abdomen, can be orangey in colour sometimes as well. And when they come out of the eggs, I'll talk about the eggs in a second, when they come out of uh, the eggs and they start growing, they're quite small obviously, they do that molting thing we talked about before, they shed their skin every now and then, they get bigger and bigger until they're full size. But when they start out as young ones, they're, they're quite pale, they have lots of whites, lots of pale browns and grey coloration on them. And as they grow, they'll go through about seven or eight molts, as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they get darker and darker and darker. So we occasionally get inquiries where people are talking about, oh, I've got, I've got a spider that's got a red or an orange stripe, but it's not all black, it's sort of pale brown, it's got whites on it. And especially they talk about them having banded legs, sort of pale and dark bits on the legs. That's just a, a slightly younger female redback spider. Still a redback, still got plenty of venom, certainly not worth mucking around. Uh, with. So that's just a slightly younger one. Now the thing about redback spider venom is that it's actually relatively simple to, uh, if you haven't seen the spider, to work out uh, whether it was a redback that bit you or not. Because the place where they bite you, it perspires. There are little beads of perspiration around it. I've actually seen somebody bitten by a redback and I've seen the drops of perspiration. And there might be one other spider that can do it, but 99% of all other spiders don't do that. So doctors use it if, if people have been bitten by something, if they're sticking their hand into a letterbox or underneath some rubbish or something, they end up at hospital, they'll just wipe it off and they'll let it sit there, little beads of perspiration, redback spider, and then they'll try and work out what to do next. Now the other thing is that um, male redback spiders are actually quite small compared to the female, they're actually tiny um, and they don't, they're not black, they've got a little bit of a sort of orangey stripe on them but not much at all and they've got these these grey and brown and white stripes on them. After mating, uh, where the male mates with the female, um, they can she can produce these, these egg sacs. These egg sacs are a size of a, a large pea, basically. And they can hold anything up to about 200 eggs each. So when they hatch out, there's lots of baby redbacks heading everywhere. The good news is that not all of them actually reach adulthood. They'll be eaten by other things. They'll die um, from natural causes. They might eat each other occasionally but there certainly are a lot of redbacks out there. This is the one spider around my house that I actually get rid of whenever I see one. I don't think it's a threatened species. It's all over Australia now, so it's not in any danger, 
but I do bump them off uh, if I can find them, especially when my kids were little. But certainly you, you've often probably seen these, uh, these egg sacs sitting around inside the webs where there are red banks. As I said, they're found um, all over Australia nowadays. Probably they, they weren't like that originally. Um, as far as I'm aware, a lot of Aboriginal people don't have stories about redback spiders. They didn't have a name for them. Um, so they probably weren't significant to many Aboriginal people around the country. But these are all the museum records that we have of redback spiders um, in our collection. Uh, we can got a big collection, a research collection stored out at Welshpool, and these are all the geographic locations from whence they've been taken. And certainly there's a, there's a broad coverage all over all of Western Australia, most of Western Australia. Now there's also a, another species that's um, been turning up the last, uh, well, probably since the Second World War, but um, more recently they've come into some of the towns in the Kimberley. And I've now heard, heard stories or heard a couple of people describe to me that they might be down in the Pilbara by now as well. This is called the brown widow spider, Latrodectus geometricus. Um, it looks a bit different to redback spiders. I don't have an image of one. This is um, an image of their egg case. And you can see instead of being a smooth egg case um, that we sh I showed you before, this one's got little uh, nodules that come out. They look a little bit like those old sea mines that the ships used to drop to get submarines and things. They've got little points coming out of them. So they're turning up. These, these have been introduced into Australia and they're turning up in various places up in the north. They're probably going to become more widespread as there's more mining and movement of equipment up and down the coast. So this is the ones where, one of the ones we're keeping an eye on. They don't seem to be any more dangerous than redback spiders. In fact, they're probably, in terms of venom, they're probably a little bit less dangerous, but uh, they're turning up all over the place and they're found right around the tropics all over the world. Um, so this is an advice I took from the Red Cross website. Um, in, they claim that in 2001, about 1,300 Australians were bitten by redback spiders. Last recorded death, oh, I was 1964. I said the mid-50s, my apologies, 1964. Um, don't panic, the black, uh, redback spider's venom is slow acting. Sharp, bite is sharp and painful. Uh, mostly be on extremities like hands and feet. Um, there'll be swelling. It looks like it is producing sweat. That's the perspiration I was talking about before. There'll be muscle spasm, spasms may occur and, and might begin to feel nauseous. There's more, I think, so head number one. They recommend an ice pack to the bitten area, rest and always seek medical help. Um, the ice pack just lessens the pain basically. So as you're probably aware, if you've ever done a first aid course, a packet of frozen peas wrapped in a tea towel makes a perfect ice pack. So always keep frozen peas in the fridge and they recommend calling an ambulance and don't attempt to drive yourself to hospital. Certainly not at 100 miles an hour. Now, some of the other spiders I'm gonna run through include uh, wolf spiders. These are, these are amongst my favorite spiders. Wolf spiders are all characterized by having these four really large eyes on the top of the head. And they've got excellent, excellent vision. Some of them might even have color vision, we think, as well. So wolf spiders are one of these things that people, I've, I've heard of people seeing them out at night, don't like them, a bit scared of them. Um, I think they're an amazing asset to any landscape. I think they're wonderful spiders. And they're really easy to go out and see at night. If you've never done it, um, the thing to do is to get a head torch, get a torch or something or a torch and you need to hold it up near your eyes not not down at waist level if you hold it up like this and you go around on here in grass even in your backyard if you've got a bit of lawn out the back just do this and what you'll see is a uh, is what my daughters call sort of diamond reflections it's a it's a silvery yellow light and it's actually the light reflecting from the back of these this set of eyes here and it reflects back at you and you can walk straight up to the spider you just keep your light on it like this walk straight up to it and you can find the spider and you can even find the tiniest little spiderlings as well um, that do this. Um, and so if you want a good party trick and amaze your friends, take them out in the backyard with a, with a torch and see if you can find some wolf spiders. A very, very common type of spider around houses across all of Australia are various sorts of huntsman spiders. This is an example of um, another episode where I was trying to take photographs for, of huntsman spiders um, on, on my dining room table. Um, and I was downloading them onto my laptop computer, which is this one here. And this one also crawled out and I got a good photograph of it on my laptop spider screen. And my wife was also sitting at the other end of the table marking exam papers from the university where she worked. And I said, oh, honey, don't panic, but there's a big huntsman spider walking across the table until I got it back into the container. So huntsman spiders um, do regularly come inside houses um, in Australia. Um, often it's partly because um, 
houses, I guess, are a little bit like giant lobster traps. They can get in easily. They probably can't find their way out quite so simply. Um, and yet they, the females in particular seem to occasionally like coming inside houses, laying their eggs um, in places where they feel secure. So in the wild, they would normally do it under the bark of trees or some other secluded place. Our houses kind of mimic that environment for them. They often like doing it behind curtains, laying their eggs and looking after them behind curtains. And once again, the egg sac can produce a couple of hundred babies um, and when they disperse throughout the house, um, it's happened in our house once, you'll get this sort of a couple of hundred little babies walking across the ceiling all dropping down and it's not a it's not a good look unless you happen to like spiders but uh, we managed to get a lot of them outside but it took quite a long time so huntsman spiders are quite common um, like wolf spiders and huntsman spiders certainly um, a bite once again is painful they're not considered particularly dangerous though I've never I can't tell you anything about personal effects from spider bites unlike scorpions I've been stung a few times I've actually never been bitten by a spider. So I've worked on spiders for 30 years, but I haven't been bitten yet because I'm quite careful about how I handle them. But people tell me that it's much less painful than a bee sting. Um, now, white-tailed spiders. There was a time during the, from about the late 70s, early 1980s through to, for about 20 years, there was lots of media attention about white-tailed spiders uh, and the fact that they could cause these really large necroses, skin deaths. So you would end up the reports were that people would be bitten, um, say on the arm, and the skin would all start to slough away um, and cause often these really large necrotic sores, um, sometimes going down past the skin layer down into the muscle. Uh, these spiders are very, very common in houses. They, they feed on other spiders. They don't make their own web. Um, they just cruise around looking for things, particular black house spiders. They can walk up walls. I've seen them walk across ceilings. They occasionally end up in, they can end up in bedding, um, laundry hampers, clothes left on the floor. Um, and some suburbs seem to have many more of them than others. Um, I live in Mount Hawthorne and we rarely see them in our house, yet uh, other people I know living in other suburbs seem to see them quite regularly. They've got a very characteristic body shape. It's um, long and slender. They're often described as cigar shaped and they've got this, this creamy pale patch on the end of the abdomen, uh, hence the name white-tailed spiders. Now, the, I'm not sure if I've got another slide. Yeah, so they're quite common. Um, this, is, this is, once again, our museum records. They're found in the, more commonly in the southwest, occasionally some records up in the Pilbara. So the big question for us a few years ago was, can a bite from one of these things really cause, cause necroses? So in the 1990s, a colleague of mine in Brisbane and I wrote a short letter to the Medical Journal of Australia saying that, well, maybe there were no, because there were no re absolutely confirmed cases of white-tailed spider bites causing large necroses, maybe it could be caused by something else. And we, we talked about um, something called Mycobacterium ulcerans, which is a type of, um, microorganism that's found in soils in places like Victoria in particular, where some of these cases had come from. Maybe it was a, the re, things thought to be white-tailed spider bites might have been Mycobacterium ulcerans. We got, um, we got uh, a bit of negative feedback from that. We also got a lot of positive feedback. We had doctors talking about things that have been diagnosed as white-tailed spider bites turning out to be skin cancers, um, bacterial infections, fungal infections, general scabs, infected, infected sores from sand fly bites, all sorts of things basically. Um, and then about 10 years ago, there was a study published um, in a medical journal that where anybody who had presented with a definite white-tailed spider bite at a hospital or a clinic or to the Red Cross or to a museum where they still had the spider. The spider was identified by an expert and the reactions were catalogued. Now what turned out is that uh, white-tailed spiders um, certainly could cause a small ulcer, the size of about a five cent piece in, in, in some cases, not in all. And that's true of many spiders. Many spiders can do that with a bit of secondary infection. There were no cases of very, very large necroses. And to me, one of the killer arguments was the fact that there were many, many white-tailed spider bites reported in um, sort of anecdotally and in the literature from the Darwin region. So medical doctors looking at the results of bites saying, oh, that's a white-tailed spider bite. And yet we know for a fact that white-tailed spiders and their relatives don't occur within a thousand kilometers of Darwin. 
So it seemed that during the 80s and the 90s, there were many, many different types of symptoms that doctors and clinicians were seeing, and they'd say, oh, it's a white-tailed spider bite. That's what you've been bitten by, and with no, with no evidence whatsoever. Now, having said all of that, I wouldn't like to be bitten by a white-tailed spider. Um, we don't know if the venom is actually quite dangerous. We suspect that there might be things around the mouth parts of white-tailed spiders and other sorts of spiders that might cause secondary infections, and maybe they can cause a small ulcer, but there's no evidence that they can cause, cause these really large necrotic sores that uh, people were talking about in the early 1980s. Um, so it was often on the television, on the radio, front pages of some of the newspapers. But uh, it seems that whatever was causing those large necrotic sores, it wasn't the spiders. Um, so yeah, this is the um, white-tailed spider bite. People talk about there being an initial burning pain followed by swelling and itchiness, and they occasionally will blister or have these little local, local ulcerations. Now the things they like to feed on, in particular, as I said, are the spiders, and the things they really like to feed on are black house spiders. So this is actually the corner of our pergola in our backyard, so it comes to a right angle there. And this is a little typical funnel entrance of the black house spider, so it's about, it's about one, one and a half centimetres in length. Um, it's got this typical sort of thick grey web that's in this sort of latticework arrangement and going down when they get big enough or old enough you can see this funnel like entrance and every so often I've had people contact us saying oh we've just found a funnel web spider but this one's actually making a, its web up in the corner I said no that's not a funnel web spider they're always down on the ground this one's in fact a black house spider so they're quite common um, we're not aware of the venom of these being dangerous to humans at all I've never heard of anybody being bitten one by one certainly what is obvious is that the web can be a real nuisance if you like your pergola to look neat and tidy. I don't care about my pergola looking neat and tidy, so I'm quite happy for these giant spider webs. So I guess you know, one of the questions I set out to answer at the beginning of this, um, are spiders, are they friends or are they foes? Well, most spiders have venom glands. Very, very few actually lack them altogether. Um, there's a couple that do. Most large spiders can bite humans. If they're big enough and they're angry enough, they'll, they can inject some venom. Um, but there are very few spiders that have toxic venom, venom that's toxic to humans. So we've talked about those today. So some of the trapdoor spiders, um, redback spiders in particular, um, and any other spiders um, that we know of that are really toxic to humans, such as funnel web spiders, don't occur in Western Australia. But spiders are very, very important regulators of insects. So people did calculations in the 1930s. Every spider in the world dropped dead within a year would be knee deep in insects around the world. Now, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. But certainly spiders evolved a very long time ago. Um, they radiated a lot in reaction to probably insects starting to fly. Spiders built webs to try and catch them. And ever since then, there's been this arms race, I guess, to uh, spiders trying to catch insects and insects trying to get away from them. So I'm going to quickly run through a few other little groups of creepy crawlies, different sorts of centipedes. Lots of different centipedes in Western Australia and Australia. It's big ones and small ones, long and thin, thick ones, long legs, short legs. Probably the most common one that people might see are these big scolopendrid centipedes. They can, they can get you know, 10 centimetres, sometimes up in the north you can get them even bigger. Um, many of them have these banding striped across the body as well, depending on the species. And the bite of many of them is recorded as being very, very painful. A good friend of mine was bitten on the shoulder when he was in a swag up in the Kimberley in the 1980s. And he told me, well, his, his friends told him because he couldn't remember much about it the next morning. They took three hours to drive to Broome and apparently he screamed the entire way. Big, strong, fit man. So some of them appear to be very, very painful. Apart from snakes, which I do not like, these are the things I do not like the most. If, I'm, if somebody said, what do you not want to be bitten by? Number one, this thing. And I try not to sweet, sleep in a swag on the ground because these things, you'd be horrified to know how many of these things are out in the arid zone. So I would avoid them like the plague. We're often asked, which end is poisonous? So this is the head end here with the antennae coming out. These are what are known as the anal legs. The anus is just on the end here. And people often think that that's actually the dangerous bit. And when they're annoyed, often what they'll do is they put their tail up in the air and they'll wave, wave those legs around in the air. And it's probably as, a, as a, like a little deterrent and a bird or something might peck at that. Um, 
grab that, it'll break off and the centipede can make, us, make its escape. People often think that's where the venom is. The venom is in, in fact comes out of the mouth parts on the underside of the head and like that there's a great big pair of black fangs and that's the stuff that does all the damage and the venom glands go back into the rest of the body and they can inject a fair amount of venom each time they do it. So it's the front end that's uh, the, the nasty end. We also get these things called so-called house centipedes. They're called house centipedes overseas. Um, they don't occur in houses very often in Australia. Very, very long legs, very, very fast. Uh, they're found all over Australia and apparently a very, very painful bite. Um, although I've never spoken to anybody who's been bitten by one. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about millipedes. They differ from centipedes. They have no poison glands or fangs. They're round in cross-section. If you cut them in half, they're circular rather than centipedes being flattened and they usually have a lot more legs. So you can get roly-poly ones that look a bit like slaters or pill bugs, um, big thick ones, you can get some with yellow heads. Great, this was a great big one that occurs up in the Pilbara. Um, these, this occurs down in the Cary Forest, got a white stripe down its back. And um, the, oh, that wasn't, I wasn't expecting that slide. And millipedes are certainly um, not dangerous, although many of them have actually a toxic compound that are actually extruded through glands down the side of the body. And so some of them can be quite smelly. I imagine if you got it into your eye, it would be quite painful, but it's not, they're not considered dangerous. Certainly the one that's probably the, the most nuisance nowadays is the Portuguese millipede, which has in, been introduced to Australia from Europe, probably in the 19th century. Um, it's all over parts of southern South Australia. If you've ever been to Adelaide or the Eyre Peninsula, um, they're quite a nuisance. They've been up in the hills here for years and now they're starting to move down throughout the suburbs. So we're getting them more frequently um, down here on the Swan Coastal Plain about the last five years. I'm not exactly sure why. There might be a form that's evolved that can suddenly cope with the, the drier weather we have here compared to up on the hills. But they're a nuisance, many of them, some of them, but not considered particularly dangerous. Now, when I give these talks, I you know, I'm often talking to groups of people who don't like spiders, think they're dangerous. And so on average, the Bureau of Statistics talk about um, spider bites in Australia, maybe one fatality every few years, um, about the same as sharks. There's about one a year on average. Um, snakes, there's a lot more. Dogs, a lot more people are actually killed by dogs, unfortunately, every year. Um, and in fact, I, I, learned, I learned many years ago to put this, this into, a, uh, into this slide when I talk about what's dangerous to humans out there. Because normally what I've been saying is the most dangerous thing of all, and in fact, honeybees. If anybody has an allergic reaction to a honeybee, they can be quite fatal. Um, ants are another big problem in places like Tasmania, where a lot of people are susceptible to the jack jumper ants. And I used to give this talk saying, oh, dogs are quite dangerous, but the bees are the worst. And these little eight-year-old kids that go, oh, 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 what about humans? What about cars? Cars are dangerous too. So yes, that's very true. Cars kill more than everything else put together. So I've learned to put cars into my, into my slide presentations. So, so these are some of the statistics that have been put together by um, various sources, including the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Um, snakes, one or two. Dogs, on average, per year, one or two. Um, spiders, we're not sure how many bites there are a year. Um, certainly you can see there's lots and lots of attacks, very few fatalities. That ratio changes of course with sharks. I mean, if you're bitten by a shark your chances are you might not come through with it because it, it's just so massive. Um, we don't know how many people a year are killed by bees, wasps and ants but they estimate there's probably in the vicinity of about 20 people a year um, killed by, by bees and their relative, relatives and road fatalities are quite high. So I use this as a way of putting it into perspective. A lot of people don't like spiders. They might have a spider phobia. I get contacted by people frequently about trying to cure their spider phobia. When you've got to go and see a specialist, so I just work on spiders. And certainly there hasn't been a fatality for, as, that we're aware of for several decades. So if you're scared of spiders because they th you think they might kill you, then, um, then that's probably a little bit misplaced. If you have a phobia, that's a different thing and needs, needs to be treated and can be treated relatively simply. Um, one, of the, one of the two myths I'm just going to quickly run through before I finish is that um, about five, five or more years ago, there was an email that started coming around um, which looked like this. It came out on Red Cross, Red Cross um, sort of banner. 
Um, please take note of this spider. It's very dangerous. Please warn kids. Sounds like Red Cross terminology, doesn't it? Kids. And send to everyone you know to alert them as well. It's breeding at a rate of speed, whatever that is, and is found in more and more houses. Um, and this, this kind of spread like wildfire. Um, and it talked about a particular type of spider that was in Eastern Australia and it was heading to Western Australia. Now, we knew this was a hoax, hoax straight away, a malicious hoax, because apart from the Australian Red Cross, the terminology and the images I'm about to show you were in fact identical to a set of emails that were around about five years before that that were talking about a spider that was invading the USA and it was coming up from South America. So some dill has turned it into a hoax where they've manufactured it into an Australian story and then they turned it into coming to Western Australia and they've even gone so far as to put the Australian Red Cross banner on the top of it. Now, the, these images aren't very pretty but this is actually embedded in the, the body of the email. Um, this is a type of spider, um, sometimes called a violin spider. We have had a couple of records of these spiders in Australia but certainly they're not very common. Um, colleagues of mine in America who know this email very well, they see it all the time, they've seen these photographs before, they actually seem to think that these two here are not related to these two and that these are actually from the result of somebody who'd been bitten by a really toxic snake in Central America and this can often happen, you get this vast um, skin death that occurs around the snake bite um, it's all sorts of venoms in it that, that destroy the muscle. And what somebody's done is put all of these images together and put them inside the body of an email trying to warn us how dangerous these are. And so these things have just, this email has just been spread around and I've got this stock standard response whenever it's sent to me. I say, it's untrue, the whole thing's a hoax. These spiders, we might have one or two records in Australia but they're certainly not very common and they're so we know where they are and they've never bitten anybody, um, please delete the email and please don't send it on to anybody else because it just fuels the fire. Um, the Red Cross website in fact has a disclaimer and it says all about the fact that this um, email is not an official communication. We do not send unsolicited emails with health warnings, blah blah blah. So it's a complete and utter hoax. The other one that I um, just going to finish on, and, I, and the reason I don't have a slide is I actually haven't got a, strangely enough, I haven't got a photograph of the spider in question, and that's the daddy longleg spider. So daddy longlegs are very, very common. You find them in the corners of rooms, in especially disused room sheds in particular. You'll find a daddy longleg spider. They've got great big long legs. Um, and the story started, story started coming out in the late 1980s, I guess the early 1990s, where the story was that um, a, uh, sorry, a daddy long leg spider has got the most toxic venom of any spider but the fangs are so small that they actually can't pierce your skin. But if you ate one, you'd be dead in five minutes. Now this was kind of amusing until it ended up in a Reader's Digest book of dangerous animals of Australia as one of these really dangerous things. So when I saw this I thought, great, that's just fantastic. So I contacted Reader's Digest or in Melbourne or Sydney or something and said, um, where did you get this information from? We don't think it's true. So luckily the next edition they, they'd taken it out. But then um, as far as we're aware the whole thing is just false. I think that probably what's happened is that somebody has seen a daddy long leg spider attack and kill and eat a redback spider. So they're probably thinking, well if redback spider's got, is very venomous, then daddy long leg spiders must be even more venomous because it's like venom against venom. But it doesn't work like that. Daddy long leg spiders catch their prey in a way that they've got such long legs that they can spin vast amounts of silk out of the spinnerets which are at the end of their abdomen and they can, they can bring it out like, a, like just in vast amounts in big sheets of it. And they can get close enough to something like a redback spider and literally just wrap it up like this. And the redback spider is trying to bite the daddy long leg spider and can't get close enough. So they wrap it all up until the redback spider is like this and it can't move. Then the daddy long leg spider comes in, gives it a bite and kills it. So I'm thinking that maybe that's, that's how it's ended up being the most dangerous spider in the, wor in the world it was called at one stage. And the funny thing was that when Fremantle Prison was still Fremantle Prison, I had a call one day from the, the governor or whoever the head of the prison was and he said, oh, are you in the spider section? This is the 
you know, the governor of the Fremantle prison. And I thought, oh, why is he ringing me of all people? He said, we've got a situation down here. And I said, well, are you sure you've rung the right section? He said, you know, it's the spider section. I said, well, okay, go on. And he said, well, we've got, a, we've got an inmate here who's threatening to commit suicide. And I said, look, seriously, you've got the wrong person here. I can't help you with suicides. He said, no, he's got a daddy long leg spider and he's going to eat it. And, and we've heard that it's so dangerous that he'll be dead in five minutes. What should we do? And I actually, like the good public servant I am, I actually started to laugh. So I showed a huge, huge amount of sympathy. And I said, well, as a government employee, I really should suggest that you um, take the spider away from him and get him not to eat it because, you know, it could be quite dangerous. I said, but if he does eat it, could you let me know? Because I really want to know what their reaction is. So I, they never called me back, which, and I, I kept an eye on the newspaper the next couple of days. So, so anyway, it turns out that probably they're just completely harmless. Now, I'm going to thank you very much for your time. Happy to ask questions afterwards. Um, you know, I had a picture up earlier of Harry Butler. Um, Harry Butler's a great benefactor to the museum. And there's a couple of uh, spiders and things that I work on called pseudoscorpions that uh, Harry Butler, when we named after Harry over the last few years. And as a kid growing up in suburban Melbourne, I was captivated by Harry's um, TV program that was on in the 70s. And in some ways, he was an international forerunner of programs like David Attenborough's programs. And I've always been grateful to Harry for the great yarns he, he told on the screen. They, you look at them now and they're seriously dated. But at the time, you know, as a 14, 15 year old kid in Melbourne, I was captivated by what this man was able to do. To meet him in the flesh when I moved over to Western Australia in the late 80s and then to be able to be involved in, in naming some species after Harry was a great thrill to me. So I'm always grateful to the, the great man, he's a big man, and for what he's done for natural history in Australia. So I want to thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>